Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Horn Camp Connect live from KDHC. Oh, we have some echoey speakers here because we're live and in person and in the same place. It's amazing. Uh, this is an offering of Coromont Music, of course, and I am your staff moderator, Elizabeth Simmons. Today's se session of Horn Camp Connect live from KDHC will be led by Jesse McCormick and will feature Bill Purvis, who's right there. <laughs> As always, before we jump into the session, a few Zoom housekeeping items. So that everyone's able to hear the presentation, we've muted all participants. Please stay muted for the duration of the session unless one of our presenters asks you to unmute. If you click on participants at the bottom of the screen, you should see a participant list pop up. If the name associated with your Zoom account is different from your own name, please click on the blue more button next to your name, select rename and enter your name. If you'd like to include your pronouns with your name, please do. If you click on chat at the bottom of the screen, you should see a chat box appear. Comments posted in the chat section are affected by the drop down menu above the text box. Depending upon your selection, of course, your comments will be viewed by everyone or by individual participants. Each time that you enter a comment into the chat, please double check your selection so that your comment is seen only by your intended audience. And with that, I'll hand the session off to Jesse. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. So, welcome everyone to not only Horn Camp Connect, but Horn Camp Connect live from Kendall Betts Horn Camp. So, uh, if you are joining us for the first time, welcome. If you are joining us for the 12th time, also welcome. We're glad to have you back. What's very exciting this time is that if you've been with us for a while, uh, you know how much we love to talk about the camp and getting back there and being around one another. And here we are, it's finally happening. And we're very excited that you can join us uh, virtually for uh, what we're uh, hoping is gonna be a very good, successful and thriving two weeks. Uh, so uh, you are here with us for warmups this morning, first morning of warmups. Uh, the way this is gonna work is Bernard and I are going to take turns every other day alternating between doing warmups. So, um, you're very lucky you got to start with me first. That means that uh, I get to tell you to only listen to me, don't do anything that Bernard says. All right, just nod and smile, and, and then, uh, yeah, don't do a word he says. So, um, now, simultaneously, while I'm leading the online warm up, he is in another room uh, uh, just next door leading an in person warm up, and no doubt he is telling them the exact same thing. Uh, so, I will be with them tomorrow morning trying to undo everything Bernard has done with them. So, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I think all of you have the warm-up packet that we, that Bernard and I have prepared. Uh, we have sent it in PDF form and Liz will likely make that available in the chat. Um, and we will get started here in a minute. Um, some things that are different with doing this in person from camp is that there are actually people in the room here with me now, so I'm not used to that. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, there will be some some things that are different from what we've done in the past, and we're just going to go with the flow and roll with the punches. So uh, before we get started, the last thing I want to say is uh, Elizabeth Simmons, our host for these Horn Camp Connects from live, live from KBHC, uh, has been working tirelessly on this project, putting it together, and has been uh, tremendous in uh, making all of this work for us. So uh, couldn't thank you enough. And it's also really nice that you're just across the table instead of yeah. like a thousand miles away. See? So, great. Hi. Oh my gosh, how do you do that? that? Whoa, that's crazy. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Okay, so um, just before we get started with actually playing and warming up, um, these warm ups, if you've not joined us before, uh, they're designed to be progressive. And what's different is that in the past we've done it like about once a month or once a quarter. This week we're doing uh, six progressive days. So we're starting out. Uh, with a basic introduction into horn, and then every day is building on the previous day. So hopefully when you see Bernard tomorrow, he's going to build upon what I've presented today. Um, we have designed these warm-ups for all ages and ability levels. So, um, you know, we want this to be an easy approach to horn. Um, you know, we both believe firmly that uh, uh, you can't make something sound easier by working harder. So we start from a very easy approach on the horn, and both of us do that daily anyways in our, our regular routines. Uh, so no screeching up to high Z's in the first uh, five minutes. Um, so 
Uh, we will do less explanation as the week goes on for the sake of time, just based on the exercises that we've already presented in the previous days. Uh, by the end of the week, the material will get pretty advanced. Uh, so we encourage you to participate as much as you feel uh, the ability to participate. So there's no pressure. If something seems really challenging or difficult, feel free to lay out and just audit so that you can fully understand what's going on. You don't, there's no pressure to force yourself to play anything. Uh, so let's see. The sing, buzz, play, create concept we introduced during the song of the day can be applied to any of these exercises. So uh, Bernard and I are firm believers that this is a warm-up, which is an option of many. Um, you know, neither of us really will say there's only one warm-up that you can do um, because that's, that goes against our general philosophy of horn, which is there are many ways to do everything. And so why not, you know, be a musical sponge and learn as many of them as you can and then uh, tailor it to your own needs and wishes on horn. Uh, uh, let's see. At the end of each morning, uh, the first hour of each session, the warm up portion, I will try to leave time for questions. But, uh, you know, I'm going to be jumping around and trying to be as clear uh, and concise as I can be. If anything seems confusing or you have a question or you need to call me out on something that I've just misspoken about, uh, feel free to put it in the chat and we will uh, address it accordingly. So with that, uh, we will get started with our first warm-ups of KBHC Online 2022. We're gonna start with stretching. So uh, this requires all of us to stand up. All right, before we do our stretches, you might notice that I've got some awesome new merch here with me that I've not had before. So first of all is our, our KBHC 2022 t-shirts, all right? Totally awesome, new logo, new color, clearly very flattering, all right? So we have on the back, it says PCR, what's it stand for? Preventative Clam Retaliation. Preventative Clam Retaliation. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm sure that you can put two and two together on that. Uh, also, something that's new, a name tag, all right? We all wear these um, around camp so that you know who I am. So hopefully, hopefully you already know who I am. Also, it says my name on the screen. So. Uh, okay, so we're going to start with stretching, get the body limbered up before we engage in the horn. So we're going to do uh, uh, basically what Bernard has led us through in the past. Right? We're going to start with twisting. This is 10 reps of, you know, you want your arms out at the side, we're going to do, this is the first half, second half, okay, that, that's one rep, okay? So let's do 10 of these twisting reps, ready? One, two. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. All right, awesome. Never done those with a name tag on before. Great. All right, folding over. All right, you're just going to bend over as is comfortable. We're going to do ten counts, just kind of aiming for the floor or your toes or, you know, however far down you can get. So let's do ten counts. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, let's roll back up. Screensaver came on. Very good. Okay. All right, so now we're going to do side bends. Um, as I recall, Bernard grabs one arm, all right? So he'll grab this arm like this and pull gently to the side as we lean in that direction away from where we're pulling. And we're going to do the other side. So we're going to do 10 counts of, of arm bend, uh, side bends. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Great. Grab the other wrist, the other side. Ten more counts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Shake it out a little bit. All right, starting to feel warmed up. Arm rotations. So we're going to do 10 reps backwards and 10 reps forwards. We'll start with backward. Backward is going to be this. That's one. Forwards is that. That's one. Okay, so we're going to do backwards 10. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome. Okay. 
forwards 10. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, awesome. Last thing is shoulder strides. It's going to be a similar version as to the arm rotations, but it's just with the shoulders. So this is back, all right, and this is forward. So what are we starting with? Backwards, 10 reps backwards. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so ten forward. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Awesome, and then just shake it out. All right, you need to feel nice and limber for uh, playing the horn. Great. That gets us done with our stretches. So, you know, uh, many times we hear people uh, compare musicians to athletes, and it is an athletic thing that we're doing, right? Um, it does involve our bodies, and uh, that's why, uh, you know, musicians can be prone to injuries if they're not paying attention to their physical structure and the way they're setting up on the instrument, their posture, their position, all of those things are really good to be aware of. And uh, so that's why we start our day this way. Uh, that leads us into breathing. Again, speaking of athleticism, uh, why is breathing important, all right? Uh, it's because it's, it's our fuel on this instrument, right? So nothing comes out of, out of this thing without air, all right? So it's really, really good to um, spend a, a certain amount of time every day having awareness of your breathing and of your capacity. So uh, throughout the week, we're gonna start with some basic exercises of breathing and then we're going to get to more advanced uh, breathing exercises to increase your technique of uh, body awareness and breathing awareness. Um, so uh, adding resistance with the hand and other strategies is, is printed on the, on the sheet. So one of the exercises, a lot of the exercises that I uh, derive inspiration from come from a book called Breathing Gym, which is by a, a tuba player, Sam Palafian. Um, I started these when I was in high school and I took to them immediately and uh, I worked with Sam several times uh, who helped introduce these exercises to me. Uh, it's a really great book. I highly recommend it for anyone if you haven't seen it before. It's called Breathing Gym by Sam Palafian. Uh, so uh, he talks about uh, syllables and how you shape right, your mouth and your jaw for, get, for efficiency of getting air into the body. And what, basically what you want to do is you want to avoid points of resistance. Points of resistance basically make noise. So something like, okay, if you can hear your breathing through your throat, that means that you're breathing in with a closed throat. So a way to facilitate openness as you take in air is if you make a flat hand like this and you put it up while you breathe with a nice O syllable. And you take in a nice deep breath, all right? I'll do that a couple more times. But you notice when I do it, it's, uh, you don't really hear the air, or maybe there's a low whooshing noise, like a very low pitched whooshing, whooshing noise, it goes in through an open throat and it, it goes very uh, low in the body, okay? You notice that I'm expanding on all sides. I think of my lungs like a balloon. My shoulders go up a little bit, but that's a result of my body filling up with air. That's not a result of me pulling my shoulders or creating uh, body tension as I inhale. So I'll demonstrate that a couple more times. So. Let's do one more. Awesome. So on all of our uh, inhalation, exhalation exercises, feel free to use that technique to remind yourself, to train yourself to, to always be taking air in with really nice open, uh, open capacity, breathing very deep. All right. Uh, so we're just going to start with some basic exercises. The first one is just an in-out counting exercise. So uh, you see we have printed three, four, fives, and sixes. So that means we're going to breathe in for three counts, and we're going to exhale for three counts. And then we're going to do fours, fives, and sixes. So I want you, as we're doing ins and outs, I want you to think of the breath as being circular. So if we start at the bottom, we're breathing in for three counts. And when we get to the top, all right, uh, keep the throat open. We all have that little mechanism that <laughs> mechanism that we can we can close off the throat keep that open so we want at the 
top we suspend and then we just come right around as we exhale okay so i will count us off three for nothing okay so we're going to do three and three out four and four out and so on and so forth so three for nothing one ready Four in. Five in. And six in. Good. Nice deep breath in and out. Okay, this is all just about getting good airflow, right? Learning our capacity. You might have noticed as we did six counts, right? You're starting to fill up. Three felt pretty comfortable, but then you're adding counts on top of that. By the time we get to six, it's like, whoa, I'm starting to feel pretty full. This is great. That leads us into uh, building the first half of the capacity breathing. Um, so capacity breathing is, is what it's... Uh, Sounds like it's all about bringing awareness to how much air we can actually bring into our bodies. Uh, I talk all the time about how I think it's very easy for us to uh, uh, get used to operating in the 20 to 70 range, 20% to 70% capacity. That's what that means. So uh, we don't actually exhale all the way, right? We think, oh, I'm, I'm empty, but actually you have, you have that much more air left in your lungs, all right? And also we take in a deep breath before we play a phrase. Okay, well, I still have that much more air on top of it, all right? So this exercise is all about understanding what 100% means for you and what 0% actually means for you. So the first half, we're going to learn how to uh, get ourselves to 100%. So I want you to take a nice deep breath, and you can use this, uh, this tool technique if you want to, but this is all about getting to 100%. So... Inhale to what you think is 100%. Keep the throat open with that closing mechanism. Don't use it, okay? And then after you get to 100%, I'm going to ask you to sip two times so that you're going to 101 and 102%, all right? You're really trying to stretch your capacity safely and comfortably. So it's going to look something like this. So hopefully you can see my two sips, right? So I'm trying to expand and take in even more air and really feel what full for me is. I'm gonna demonstrate one more time and then we'll do two together, okay? All right, and just let it go. So let's do two of these together, all right? First one, here we go. Again, you'll probably see, you'll probably notice that I'm expanding a lot on the top, and that's fine. I am still thinking of my lungs as a balloon. I'm expanding in the front and the back, on the top, on the bottom, on the sides, everything goes out, all right? I'm not, I'm not pulling with mus my muscles or, or tensioning like that, it's just expanding. Let's do uh, another uh, full, full capacity breath together. Here we go. Excellent. Now, as you do this more and you get uh, used to this sensation, it might be a new sensation for some of you and saying, wow, this is really uncomfortable. I don't know how I feel about this. As you get used to it, you'll actually get closer to your 100% on the first inhalation, all right? And the second, the second two sips will just be very teeny tiny, or maybe you won't even get in that much more air. That's the goal, is to really get to 100% on your first breath. So Bernard will take you through the second half of that exercise tomorrow. Uh, so let's Keep going. All right, so we're to our uh, first notes on the horn, first notes buzzing. Uh, so uh, we're going to free buzz where it's easiest. And you know, free buzzing is something that, um, in my opinion, is not a prerequisite to being a great horn player. Um, free buzz for me didn't show up until many years later, and even then I have a pretty terrible free buzz in my own opinion. And there are other people who can free buzz and they, you know, have a five octave range and they can like, like 
It can do you know incredible arias with three buzz. I, I can't do that. I, I have about two note range. <laughs> So, but free buzz just, you want it to be very comfortable, very easy, and try not to judge what it sounds like, you know, and I'll demonstrate. My free buzz tends to be higher than Bernard's, his is a lot lower. Um, he, he also is much more skilled in free buzz than I am. My range is probably something like, whoa, I got an octave, okay. Oh my gosh, that's a breakthrough moment. So, <laughs> but again, it's just uh, a, li a little bit of lip tension. I know that's a scary word, but sometimes it can be used good. Just enough lip tension, all right, and, the, and good air. So let's just try some free buzz. Just wherever it's comfortable for you, all right? So um, now we're going to put that onto the mouthpiece, all right? So uh, feel free to buzz wherever the pitch is that you like. Um, we've got a triad printed here on the page, all right? So that would be It can be anywhere in there, all right? Let's maybe aim for, pick any one of those three pitches, either a C, an E, or a G. We're just going to think about free, easy buzz, and that nice, beautiful air that we just, that we just warmed up, okay? So let's do that as a group. Here we go. Nice deep breath. Yeah, awesome. You may have noticed that I didn't articulate it. I just started with a oh. I'm just not getting the tongue into the equation yet. Okay, we're just starting with air and buzz. Um, I think that actually doing ho or breath attacks um, in a lot of areas of my playing is really beneficial. I think the tongue uh, it actually gets in the way for us a lot um, and inhibits our playing. So uh, if you take the articulation out of out of the equation, I think it eases a lot of a lot of issues. That then you can add the tongue back in once you've got the notes and the buzz the, the buzz in the air going. Uh, I actually use this in orchestral playing all the time. Uh, okay, so uh, he he mentions here seashell air, right? Breath attack using a seashell air. That's what I was just talking about. Seashell air on the horn is when you start with, you know, we've all like listened to a seashell and that, that, that um, airy quality that, um, that's what is, is meant by seashell air. So let's put this on the horn now, okay? So we all buzzed either a C, an E, or a G. Uh, we're gonna do that on the horn. So starting with seashell air, it's going to sound like this. So we're on the open F horn, and I just, I started my air, and then the, the lip decided the buzz whenever it wanted to, and it picked the E, right? That's where it just decided to land. So maybe try to aim not too, too, too much for one of these notes, C, E, or G, on the open F horn, all right? Keep that nice, warm, beautiful air going that we warmed up. Let's do a nice seashell air attack, uh, long tone all together. Good. So what you may have noticed is like, what I was trying to do is once I got my air going and the note actually buzzed, um, a lot of times we can approach long notes or, or uh, long tones like this in a very stagnant way. I think of them as being alive and active and growing. So my air is always going somewhere. I'm blowing through the note rather than at it. So I'm trying to create this note that has, has a life, like has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, I find that that makes uh, my playing more interesting and keeps me engaged and active in doing what, uh, in my mind in doing what I'm doing. So uh, let's go on to Ho Do Do. So I'm going to set a quarter note equals 60. I'm not sure that we actually need the metronome, but uh, it's going to be right about here. Okay, we're going to do this on the F horn if you're comfortable, but as we get to the end, if you're, if you're more comfortable using standard B flat fingerings, that's no problem. 
Um, so this is all about getting our articulation added to the equation of buzz and air, okay? It's called ho do do because that's the articulation that we're going to use. So we're going to start these as ho do do on the horn, all right? And again, approach this from a nice, easy place, all right? I'm going to keep repeating myself. You can't make something sound easier by working harder. So you have to start at a place from ease, okay? I'll demonstrate what the first one is going to sound like, and then we're going to ascend. We're going to take one measure off for breathing, really good breathing that we've already warmed up, and we're going to climb chromatically on the F horn. Okay, the first one is going to sound like this. You might notice the first time trying this that the note doesn't speak all the first time, uh, and that's okay. It's going to be, oh, that's totally fine. This is all about finding that spot where you have the right amount of tension, uh, right amount of tension in the lip for the air to create the buzz. All right. So let's do this together. I'm not going to set the metronome. We're just going to keep count at quarter measure equals sixty all together. All right. Here we go. Four counts for nothing. One, two. D flat. B natural. Is the hodo do exercise. Um, if that's new to you, maybe what you're noticing is uh, it's, it's a different sensation to get the air and the buzz going, and then to add the tongue. Right? We let the articulation ride on what we've established with the with the air and the tongue. It's just a different way of approaching a note and uh, thinking about starting our notes. Uh, interesting story there. Uh, I think it was. I hope I'm going to get this correct. Um, uh, I think it was Clevenger was working with a student who uh, was going to play the uh, Mahler 5, right? And the last movement of Mahler 5 starts after the Adagio, the fourth movement, where it's just strings and maybe winds, but the brass don't play, right? We just sit and listen to this amazing, amazingly beautiful music. And it just, it just tapers off really gently. And then the first note of the, of the fifth movement of Mahler 5 is this horn pitch. 
and it can be really stressful for horn players, you know, after sitting there for a movement. Okay, I gotta not practice note. And, um, you know, a student was like really freaking out about it. And Clevenger walks over and puts his hand on his shoulder and says, breath attack it. You know, and it's just, all right, makes it super easy. And everyone in the audience just thinks, wow, that was beautiful. Just a little story I heard at one time. Okay, so um, this takes us into our song of the day. All right, uh, Bernard and I are, are uh, super believers in uh, being able to take any theme that you like, anything that you like, and be, uh, being able to just buzz it, just sound it out. You know, pick a song, any song it can be a pop song, can be a country song, maybe not a country song. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, whatever whatever speaks to you and just sound it out on, on the mouthpiece, all right? Because you don't need fingers, all you need is pitches. So um, this is uh, a Ukrainian folk song that Bernard has picked out, and we're just going to uh, sing it, buzz it, and then uh, play it on the horn, all right? So I'm going to get my pitch just to make sure that I'm accurate. I think, I think this is D, no, D, ah, there we go. But I caught myself. So uh, this is going to be, you can use any syllable, you can use la, you can use do, you can use ah, all right? So uh, I'm going to sing this through once. Um, why don't you join me, since I can't hear you, you're very lucky, all right? Usually Bernard does the singing and I love to mock him for it, so this is my payback. So <laughs> uh, this is going to be in three, starting on D. I'm just going to just slur through all of this as I sing, okay? Here we go, one. Ready, go. singing voice, uh, but it certainly helps to, to channel that idea. Um, for example, like when I have students working on Mozart horn concertos, I tell them to go listen to Mozart operas, because what better way to figure out Mozart, uh, phrasing that Mozart loved than to listen to the human voice in his operas. So we're going to try buzzing this, maybe not the whole thing. Let's do the first line on the mouthpiece, okay? This is starting on D. That's our note. Three for nothing. Here we go. One, ready. Good, let's stop there. All right, we're now going to put the mouthpiece on the horn. Let's do the second half of this line. So the pickup, the, or I should, excuse me, let's do the second line of this with the pickup note, the last note on the first line from the G. G A. We're going to start there. Playing on the horn, you can articulate or you can buzz whatever, uh, or a slur, so whatever is your preference, okay? So here we go. Three for nothing with the pickup. Uh, let's see. Three, one, two. <laughs> Active, warm approach, right? Spinning, spinning lines that are alive. Great. So, uh, free buzz builder. So we did some free buzzing earlier. All right. Uh, this is basically just trying to, it, uh, if you're like me and didn't have a very good free buzz or still don't, 
You can start somewhere in the range that's comfortable for you, right? So for me, that's... So I'm going to transpose what's on the page. I'm not going to play an actual C. I'm just going to try to extend up and then back down in a really nice, comfortable way. Okay, that's basically what a free buzz builder is. Um, so just trying to expand the ability and the range on, on free buzzing. So feel free to explore that on your own. Uh, mouthpiece sirens. So we're going to start on C. C. Okay. So this is just trying to uh, slur or gliss through an entire range and really make sure that our, our air and our buzz is super even through that. All right. So the slower, the better. I'm going to demonstrate once and we'll do one as a group. So you notice it's super glissy and real gooey in the middle, right? And that, that might feel a little uncomfortable at first. You might notice that you're kind of notching a little bit. That's the whole idea with mouthpiece sirens is to get it as smooth, as flowing as possible. Let's do one as a group together. Okay, nice deep, deep breath. Here we go. So that takes us right into our harmonic series. Uh, I'm not going to do this whole thing in the interest of time, just because there are a couple more exercises that I want to make sure that we get to here on our day one. But uh, so harmonic series, you know, everyone's like, how do you get so many notes on a horn with only three buttons? Uh, well, it's our harmonic series, all right? It's incredibly important to understand what the harmonic series is and to at least have um, the general pitch concept of the harmonic series in your ear, all right? That's what I think leads to very successful horn playing. Right? They always say horn players need to have really good ears. Okay, it starts from the harmonic series. So we're going to build this. We're going to start by um, doing the open F horn. Okay, we're going to start on C below the staff, nice comfortable range, and we're just going to build up an octave. So. All right, let's do that until we get all the way up to the C and then back down. Again, this is related to that siren, the, the commitment through the line all the way up and all the way down, creating these nice, beautiful arches. Okay, so let's do this as a group. First one, C and E. Let's go up to the G. Okay, up to the B flat harmonic. series because they're a little awkward and kind of funky feeling. Um, so uh, we're going to skip the eighth note por portion of this exercise for right now, but it would be if we worked our way down to the to the uh, starting on the F sharp, all right, we'd be working our way back up doing eighth notes, coming all the way back up to the C where we started. 
Very good. Okay, so um, lip trail builder. So uh, again, a lot of people, a lot of horn players avoid lip trills um, because they start out bad and then they continue to be bad on them. And then they start to fear them and so they avoid them and then it only gets worse. And uh, that actually happens with a lot of techniques on horn, right? There are certain things that you think, oh, I'm, I'm not good at that. Okay, well, probably because you just haven't spent uh, diligent time just looking at it. And it doesn't mean that you have to spend thousands of hours to get a good trill. Um, you know, we built it into the warm-ups just for that point, a, a, a minute or two, right? And starting from a very methodical place. Another thing that I notice uh, students come in all the time is I say, oh, can you do a lip trill? And they come in, oh, yeah, 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 I can do a trill. And it's super uneven, okay? It's because they're trying to go faster than they can actually control it. So the idea of building a good, effective lip trill is starting where you can control it and always staying in control. If it ever starts to get uneven, uh, then you you know that you're out of your range of control. You need to step back and always stay in a place of control. So that's what this lip trill builder does. It starts from a place of control. We're going to start on the on the uh, on the D horn. So that's uh, on the F horn one uh, fingering one and two. Okay. <laughs> We're just going to count this out at around quarter note equals 60, all right? So we start with half notes, we move to quarter notes, and then to eighth notes. So it's going to sound like this. Not like that. that flick that we feel in between the note, in between the A and, and the printed B, right? You'll feel that little notch when it, when it flips over to the B. That's what we're trying to learn how to control, is that feeling and that moment. So try to channel um, another one of our faculty members here uh, and one of my personal mentors, Randy Gardner. He talks um, a lot about recreating feelings on the instrument. So, to, you know, really try to channel the physical feeling of what it feels like when that note flips and try to recreate it. So let's do this as a group uh, on the D horn, F horn one and two, round quarter note equals 60. Take a nice deep breath. I'll count us off four for nothing. One, two, three. <laughs> gets us to our beautiful sound studies. Uh, this is one of my, my daily favorites. Uh, it's called beautiful sound studies because that's what it's intended to warm up, is our beautiful sound. I don't know about you, but the reason why I chose this crazy, insane instrument is because it sounds really cool. And it just, it resonates with, with me and my ideals as a musician and my sound concept and uh, what I want to put out in the world. And, uh, you know, I only found out later how challenging it is to actually do that. But I'm guessing it's probably the same for you. Uh, you know, you chose to play the horn because you're drawn to the unique aspects of the sound of this instrument. And um, so uh, why not have an exercise that's designed to, to, to warm up that very thing and to help you develop it? So uh, I want you to channel your ideal horn sound. And there are many of them out there. And, um, you know, everyone has their own preference. There are no right or wrongs here. So just think of like, what is the most golden, beautiful French horn sound in your head? And that's what we're trying to recreate here. So we've built our buzz, we've built our air, we've, um, we've worked on a harmonic series, we've worked on spinning a phrase, okay? So you see that these are, um, the way that they are put together on the page is a nice long slur. Okay, we were doing this in our harmonic series, I was talking about arches. That's how I want you to think of your air. An analogy I use is fire hose air. Okay, you see firemen when they when they use a fire hose, right? That the water comes out of the hose and just goes in this nice big beautiful arc. That's how I want you to think of your air. So we're gonna build the first half of this exercise. 
uh, and it's going to sound like this. Spin your air through the notes, not at them. Okay, all the while channeling your most beautiful sound concept on the horn. Okay, so let's do that one together. Just the first two measures all the way up. Here we go. So you'll hear a lot of low brass players and tuba players doing this warm up, um, and you know that's not a bad thing. It just indicates that that's you know that it works. So we're going to put these uh, four measures together now, and if you can try to do them in one breath. All right. So we've been working on our capacity breathing. Hopefully uh, that's going to get more comfortable for you. But I want you to tank up. I'm going to display the first line, and we're going to do it together just so you get an idea to get it into your ear. Okay. It's going to sound like this. Let's do this together. Now what you see is we've got some lines printed down here. The way that I build this in building my beautiful sounds is I start on C. Usually I start on G, but for today we're going to start on C. And then we build out uh, in, in both directions of the ranges alternating. So we're going to do C, and then we do D flat, and then we do B natural. That's where we'll stop for today, but you'll see uh, starting tomorrow and the subsequent days, we'll be expanding even more. And so as we go up in the range, we go down in the range. Right? We're getting that beautiful sound covering all ranges of the horn. So let's do this together starting on C and we'll do all three lines together. Okay? I'll count us off four for nothing. One, two, three. <laughs> to breathe in the middle, especially as we get into the extended ranges, that's perfectly fine, but really try to tank up and use one, one breath. Okay, so this gets us to our scales at the end of our exercises here for today. Uh, so articulated chromatic scales, thankfully we're starting out easy. At the end of the week it's going to get really, really challenging, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate uh, appropriately. But this is just quarter equal C 60. Uh, you can use uh, whatever articulation you want, ta, da, do, to, or you can slur it if you like. But this is just about bringing uh, a chromatic scale uh, awareness to us. Okay, so let's just do this together. I'm not going to demonstrate. We're going to start on C, go all the way up and all the way back down. Try it in one breath. We're going to be about, dun, 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 about that tempo. Okay, it's a little faster than 60. Starting on C, counting us off four for nothing. One, two, Good. All right, you 
you make it in one breath? I hope so. I barely made it for the record. I didn't think up enough. <laughs> okay. Um, so I also don't think I'm going to lead us through all of our scales today, but they are printed here for your reference. Okay. So uh, we're going through the circle of fifths, starting on C, articulated. Then on G. Let's at least do a couple of them. Maybe we have time to do all of them. I don't know. We'll see how I feel. All right. But let's try it on C. C articulated right at that tempo that I just sang. Uh, try to stick with me if you can. All right. I'll count us off four for nothing. Okay. Articulated scale starting on C. One, two, three. <laughs> Let's keep going. Okay, four for nothing on A flat. One, two, ready. for some, all right? I just wanted to make sure that we got through them in the interest of time. Feel free to do your scales in any tempo that you want, all right? Uh, again, staying in control on the horn and really maintaining that standard uh, is, is, I think, um, absolutely necessary for um, getting better and improving on the horn. Otherwise, you're practicing bad habits. So uh, we have these optional warm down on pedals, okay? Uh, I won't have uh, you do them as a group, but uh, this is basically just starting in the pedal range and moving chromatically down. It just really helps you, especially at the end of the day, you know, when I've played a Mahler symphony and I feel like I've, you know, taken a sledgehammer to the face, um, these things really help. Um, particularly what I love to do is start with like the first one that you've got here. So I get down to a pedal F sharp and I sit on that F sharp. And I just day crescendo and day crescendo and day crescendo. And what I find is that at first my chops are just like, no, we don't want to do that. But then they like finally will release and I'm just like, okay, we can chill out. So it's something like this.
when I can just disappear into nothing, that's when I feel like, okay, I'm relaxed. I'm going to survive tomorrow after playing the smaller, smaller Bruckner Strauss program. Uh, and I'll live to tell another day. So uh, with that, we have a couple minutes and I have not at all been paying attention to the chat because I've been standing over here doing warm ups, which I realize I forgot to sit down. So I hope that you all welcome yourself to sit for the rest of the exercises. Um, uh, Elizabeth, have you noticed any questions come through the chat? <laughs> I'm just gonna speak through okay. your microphone. Okay. Uh, no, I don't see any questions through the chat okay. right now, but if you would like to come over here, I'm literally just right there, that's amazing. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear her. <laughs> so, I think you can, because I can hear myself through my headphones, but Jesse, if you'd like to come over here, and Bill, you can get this out of here, and we'll just take a second in between. So if you want, stand up, take a stretch, get some water, and we'll have Bill right back in just a second. So. All right. Yeah, so thank you all for joining us for, for the very first HCC live from KBDC. We're very excited to have you here with us. And we're excited for the second hour. Uh, one of our featured uh, artists here at KBDC is Bill Curtis. Um, so thank you for being brave and going on the first day. And uh, he was telling us a little bit about his presentation uh, that he's going to give last night. Um, and it sounds very interesting. And so um, I look forward to, to hearing it. So. Yeah, feel free to take a break, stand up, stretch, although we already did stretches, uh, go get a drink or something, and we will get started with Bill in just a minute. In just a minute. And in the meantime, if you have any questions for Jesse, please go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, he will just step over here and talk to me oh, for yeah, a second, right. and I'll spotlight myself. All right, so here we are. Um, Bill, could you mute the computer over there? Yeah. Great. So, uh, Jesse, we have a question from Kyle. If you okay. would love to you know, sit in here. Ah. Kyle asks, is there any tips for when you run into breaks on your scales? Okay, so. Breaks on your scales, I mean, that's not necessarily different. Uh, I hope that you can all hear me. If you're having an issue hearing me, please let me know. Um, breaks on your scales is really not that different from uh, breaks in the range anywhere, right? So uh, I used to have a break. Let me, where's my horn? Uh, am I grabbing that? Thank you. So I used to have a very defined break in a place that's common for a lot of players. Um, but uh, it, it was between like G and A flat below the staff. So between those two notes, I used to have a break. Um, it was very defined. I love to play the G in my low setting and the A flat in my high setting. And that was just like a hard and fast rule. Um, what I ended up doing when I was in school, to make a long story short, is um, I got a playing injury and I couldn't play high, and uh, up until then I hadn't really spent much time in the low range, so I was like, well, here I am, this injured horn player who can't play high and who can't play low, that makes me not very valuable. So uh, I started playing in the low range, and I was like, I'm going to work out this whole break thing, and I started doing scales. Um, and so what I did is I would start in my high setting, and go below my break and stay in my high setting where it felt really uncomfortable. So if that was comfortably in my high setting, right? And I would get to where it would get real shaky, but I would blow into that resistance and try to get used to the idea of, of um, playing below my break in my high setting. Then I did the same thing uh, starting in my low setting, low, and work above my break in my low setting. So I would get used to what ended up happening over the course of weeks and months is that I, instead of having a break uh, where I could only play high and low 
you know, above or below that break. I created a range of notes, maybe five notes worth, uh, that I could play in either setting. Uh, and I continued to develop these scales and these patterns um, around my break to where I don't really have a break anymore. It just, it shifts where it needs to shift somewhere in the range. So, you know, when I play a chromatic scale, you know, it's, sorry, it's a little sloppy at the end, but you get the idea. There's not really a break there. It just shifts where it needs to shift. And uh, I did that using scales. So that's why it's part of the daily warm-up is, is uh, you can work scalar passages over those breaks. So I hope that that explained it in at least a somewhat concise and um, uh, manner that makes sense. Yeah, I think that was great. Jesse, cool. thank you so much for being here today. Yeah. And we'll switch over to Bill's featured session now. So give us just a second to turn on his mm -hmm. camera and we're right here. Hello, hello. Let me try to stop. Oh, just there I am. Here. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Jesse, thank you for that session. I really feel so rejuvenated from that and <laughs> ready to go for the day. It's very refreshing and salubrious. Oh, salubrious. That's a lovely word. We are making that the word of the day. Yes. Okay, okay. Oh my good. Salubrious. Note to self. So, good morning to everyone. Um, I thought to do something um, rather different which is focusing on a solo horn piece by Elliot Carter called Retracing Two. Um, Elliot Carter, um, in my opinion, was, is one of the most important um, composers of the 20th century, uh, certainly one of the most important American composers. But in general, people are a little bit leery of him because his music is quite complex. And part of what makes it complex is the layering on of different voices. So where Eliot's aesthetic comes from, it really comes from uh, Charles Ives and the notion of different things going on at the same time. I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard in Charles Ives when, for instance, there's a band playing in the, you know, the kind of a New England town and the band is going one way, but there's another band going the other way and you get a kind of cacophony of that experience. But Eliot um, took this to another level. I, I would describe it more as an extremely literate dinner party with guests who are all speaking to each other and articulating different ideas. And sometimes it's very humorous. Uh, sometimes it becomes animated. Sometimes it's more uh, poignant. Sometimes it's more peaceful. But there are many things going on at once. And he became very interested in this. The early, when we talk about Elliot Carter, he lived from 1908 to 2012. So that's 100 wow. to the age of 104. And he wrote from the age of 90 on, he wrote some 40 pieces. So this was an incredibly productive life right up to the end. Uh, so when we talk about the early Elliot Carter, that's kind of up until when he was maybe 50. <laughs> so, um, that part of Elliot Carter, people think of as more kind of Americana, sounding a little bit like Aaron Copeland. And I know Elliot actually um, didn't care for that description. He felt that basically he was writing the same kind of music throughout his whole career, which is this kind of theatrical approach that I'm describing. So the, the earlier, more Americana, that was the language, but the instruments were still kind of arguing with each other or discussing or agreeing or very animated conversation. And it just became a more and more complicated conversation with more people as his music um, evolved. So um, perhaps you're familiar with the Wind Quintet, which he wrote in 1948, which is a staple of the uh, Wind Quintet repertoire. It's, it's a challenging piece, but it sounds very jazzy, very approachable. It's really hard, and it's hard for the reasons I'm describing. And actually, an interesting thing is um, he used to say that he, he uh, felt very challenged writing the wind quintet because he didn't know what to do with the horn. 
The horn is such a problem, he always said. And in fact, he said, um, Gunther Schuller complained to him about the horn part. I, I think Gunther played the premiere of it actually in New York. And he complained about the horn part that, that, that Elliot didn't give him enough to do. But in the, if you know the quintet, the horn is a very particular role. The horn kind of announces things and the woodwinds are more chatty um, and chattering and uh, lively. And the horn sometimes fits in with that, but it has a very kind of uh, um, distinctive role. So um, in the early 90s, he uh, wrote a quintet for piano and winds. It was commissioned by the wonderful uh, Swiss oboist uh, composer, conductor, who was very good friends with Elliot, Heinz Holliger. And the horn player for that was Radovan Vlatkovic. And um, he was very inspired uh, by the uh, Mozart piano wind quintet and the Beethoven piano wind quintet in writing that piece. And by the way, I would say that the, the uh, piano wind quintet is uh, probably his first truly eloquent horn part. And um, before that, I, um, I had um, the honor of working with him on a number of occasions you know, throughout his life. But earlier than that, I would complain to him that I, when he didn't write such wonderful horn parts, I was reduced to conducting his pieces. <laughs> so I was really happy when he wrote this piece, and uh, um, I was honored to participate in the American premiere of it. But what he writes about this piece, which is uh, kind of interesting, I think. So um, let's see. When I accepted the commission by Heinz Holliger and Köln Musik to write this quintet for these remarkable performers, the thought of the masterpiece by Mozart for this combination led me to consider very, serious, very seriously its range of expressive possibilities. To heighten the dialectic interplay between the instruments, I decided to, to, to treat the group as having three contrasting elements, piano, horn, and a trio of woodwinds. So basically it's written as a kind of trio. Each is assigned its own musical vocabulary and its own type of ex expressivity and character derived from its instrumental capabilities. Thus, the interplay of commentary, answer, humorous denial, ironic, supportive, or self-effacing were considered as part of the musical thought and expression. Although the quintet is in one continuous movement, there are frequent changes of mood, sometimes within one instrument's part, at other times by groups. So um, he describes how he differentiates these different um, characters of, you know, kind of the three groupings. Um, but actually there's another one, which is he, uh, he writes each of these groups in a different time world. So the piano is written in triplets and sextuplets. The three woodwinds are in duples, uh, largely sixteenths, and the horn, we're very lucky we get to be in fives, which makes our part actually very challenging. So we're doing a lot of like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, or like, you know, or uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, but everyone else is playing one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, you know, that kind of thing. So um, the reason for the solo horn piece, he became frustrated that um, horn players were not playing the parts evenly. So, um, you know, the certain solos, instead of just sounding da 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 it would be da 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 because it's very hard to, you know, make that even in a different time world and still have it working out. So the solo horn piece retracing is a kind of, it, there are three different excerpts from the piano and quintet. So maybe it's good to, uh, I'm allowed to share. I can show you the retracing first here. So uh, let's see, how do I do this? I go down to, oh, I'm in the wrong place. I go down to share screen and here's the one I'm going to share. Okay, can everyone see this? So, excellent. Okay, so um, I have them marked this way because this is the order that the excerpts come in the solo horn piece. The first one is sort of the one that I was more or less 
badly singing before. <laughs> and the next one actually comes first. That's a series of excerpts, and there are little things in between them, you know, that starting here. So uh, I'll play each of these sections later in the quintet, but I thought it would be good, first of all, to just hear um, a recording of the uh, uh, retracing so you can hear how these fit together. Um, so let's see if I can succeed in doing that. <laughs> so I think it's here, there. Oh, I didn't uh, enable my, I'm sorry, I'll get this happening. Where are we? Here? All good. It's all good? I can just play it? I didn't enable go, music. Go ahead and try. Okay, let's try it. Let's see if this is working. No, not working. Okay. Okay, let me go back to... Can I be sharing them both at the same time? I should be able to, right? Yeah, just uh, if you could press play on the recording. Did you try that already? I did that. Hmm, interesting. So let's see here. This is why um, it's challenging to do the first one on the first day. <laughs> You're doing great there. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the share and then I'm going to try it again, but with a more enhanced sharing. Now share sound. Okay. And now I'll do both. And let's see if this works. Okay. Uh oh. Why is it not playing? Oh, it's not playing because the sound. Okay, now let's start it again. I think we got it. Okay. <laughs> Just to point out a few things about this. So you see at the beginning, it sounds very regular. It's just all quarter notes. Dee, dee, da, dum, dee, da. And then we have a 5 16 bar and a 5 8 bar. 
and which looks daunting. That could either be you know that kind of thing. But actually, just to point out an easier approach to that is just to treat that here as a three five sixteen bar. So you're one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five. You see what I mean? And then here, this is actually a five. It's like two fives. So the da is like one one and two uh, one two three four five one two three four five one two three four. You, you see what I mean? And then here again, we have a five six three five sixteen bar. So if you think of those that way, it's, it's a kind of way of simplifying those of going. Now this kind of being flexible, going kind of from one uh, time zone into another, like da pa 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 one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five. This is a, a technique that um, Elliot uses all the time called rhythmic modulation. And um, what he's done in writing this little piece, which is you'll see in a minute, it's much more simple the writing here than it is in the actual piano wind quintet. Um, the, and there also you have the 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 uh, the rhythmic modulations are much more complicated. Now, just looking down here, the di ra ra di pa pa pa, and this area, but da di da da. So this is actually in little three sixteen un units. If you look at this, if you can see here, so it's da di da di da da ra di pa ra ra pa. You know, but it's it's just written. It it doesn't look like that. If you understand what I mean, so do you do da 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 wa ba di da ba, and then the similar kind of thing down here that ba da da ba ba da da ba 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 da ba da 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 ba ba ba. You see what I mean? And then down here, this is in little three sixteen units. It's slower though. One, two, three, one. I mean, excuse me, three eighth units. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. Da di da di da. And then he's going over to da di da. And then this di da da di da di da wan di. So it, there's a rhythmic modulation there also. Uh, and you'll see these are more complicated in the piano wind quintet. Um, and one of my favorites in the piano wind quintet is here. So the bam da 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 da. So that actually, that moment goes from being uh, da di da one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so then those, those are actually five, a six eight in which it's five per B. Is everyone with me? <laughs> okay, so, um, and just to point out something that I thought was really interesting. So when I just got this music, um, Elliot sent it to me and I thought, oh, interesting. And he asked if I would, you know, come play it for him. And I went back and looked through all of the excerpts from the piano wind quintet. And uh, I, um, he had actually, <laughs> there were a couple of the notes that he didn't have right. And, and I was pointing out, oh, actually, that's this note or this note. And he said at a certain point, oh, I like your notes better than mine. Said, but actually, they're your notes. <laughs> but here is one place, this C and C sharp here in this bar. In the original piano wind quintet, it's actually a B and a C natural. And he said, but there, I'd actually rather change that. Because if you notice, there's a B in the octave below that. And he thought, oh, it's better to have more variety there. And I asked him, um, so do you want to change that for the piano wind quintet also? And he said, yes, I, I think I would. Yes, I would like to do that. So I had him change that in my score and then initial it. <laughs> so you can see that when we get to that place. OK, um, now how do I get to the next page? It just goes, uh, oh. So you may need to restart that share. I need to restart it? Oh, because it's, it's a different, different thing? Okay, so let's see. Now I need to restart share, share screen. 
Oh wait, it was in that same file, wasn't it? Is it there? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Stop share. Um, I didn't see it there. Just go right back to the file you were in because okay. I forgot they were all in that same packet. Now, right. how do I get to the next page? Though? Just keep scrolling. It's not scrolling. Oh, good. Why is this? If anyone can explain this in the chat. <laughs> Hang on just a second. You wanted to go to page 12. Yeah. You wanted to go to page 12, yeah. Yeah. Just a minute. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Stop share. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions for Bill so far, please go ahead and drop those in the chat answer a few now while I'm getting this pulled up or if you would like to answer some later that's fine um, just give us give us some time hmm oh, oh I see is that I see I can barely hear him lots of echoes was that me or is that Jesse okay <laughs> I'm not sure. So um, can you send those to me again? Or I don't know, maybe they're in, uh, let, let me yeah, see. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to share my screen in just a second. OK, can you share it? Mm -hmm. OK. The only thing is I can't then show where things are. But. And can I share at the same time? You, you can't share at the same time. So I can't play the recording then. All right, yeah. Anyway, so thanks so much for uh, keeping us, uh, or being patient with us. Again, if you have any questions or about anything at all, just go ahead and drop them in the chat. So is there a way to send that again to this computer? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, we, we can take another couple minutes to try to figure this out, but then what I would suggest is maybe we just uh, if you screen share the uh, score, and I'll mm -hmm. talk about it, and then we'll play the recording. Yeah, if you, you know, I think you can separately. The yeah, it's so it's, it's too bad that. because hearing the recording. Um, oh, and you, where's the uh, score for the? I have one more idea. How about if you just go ahead and play the recording now, because I'm screen sharing now. I'm, oh, okay. Okay. So go ahead with that. So let's see if that works. Yeah. So um, let's see if this is working. So I'm starting. If if you see the uh, oh, can you see the cursor on the? Does that show up? No, okay, so that where this excerpt begins, I'm going to start the recording just a little before that. Okay, let's give it a try. stuff happening.
So this, this part is in a way a sort of preparation for the opening horn solo from the retracing. initials. <laughs> okay. okay, so that's that part. Um, so you can see how those excerpts um, here, are, it's, it's in a much more complicated texture, uh, setting, context, and also the notation of it, for instance, um, here these are fives. It was kind of reversed from the other one. Oh, I can't do anything with this. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, that's an idea. Hey, okay. So, for instance, um, you can see right from the beginning of this that it's basically five against um, two, two. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, right? Um, so what I found from this is that um, actually I, I thought, oh, I'd like to play the piano wind quintet again. I think I could do this much better now. It was really good practice. Um, and I just want to show you the one other place, which is this one later, which in, in, in the, within the piece, it's one of the hardest ones. Let's see where, where that is. It, and it's 15 above, it's uh, the second page. I got it. So now I have to find that other, just one second. Okay, so you can see this, this one, the actual excerpt, this is the low part that starts here, um, where it says uh, three. And it's very slow here, and you can see the other winds in a certain way or in three, uh, three, two. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, whereas the horn is in one, two, four, five, six, but it actually is. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. So this is actually a really hard place. It's easier to be playing faster, actually. Okay, so I'll put this one on. So it's it, the recording starts a little before there, where I'm starting it. Here's a rhythmic modulation.
So actually, right after this, it, there's, it, it sort of starts into a coda um, toward the end, to get to the end of the piece. And it basically starts off with each instrument in its own time world going very slowly and little by little, faster and faster. It's kind of a very cool ending, I think. Um, OK, um, obviously, this is really complex when you get to this. But what um, I hope you can, um, uh, you can hear from this, it, it, <laughs> it's a language that you have to spend time with. But what, what's hard about it is how many things are going on at the same time. When I, f I find from the solo horn piece, what's going on in that is, is much more uh, straightforward. It sounds sort of more normal. But when you have so many of those things going on at the same time, it's a, it's a very complicated conversation. So maybe it would be valuable to go back and look at the solo piece again and listen to that. It's only like a minute long. And then maybe we can see if anyone has questions about this. How about that? Perfect. Um, so, but you put that the can, the so solo piece this, away. You can just do it up here. Oh, okay. So oh, good. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Good. And I think I have this set up so that it doesn't won't play the ad. I hope so. <laughs> Okay, I, in, in what I recognize hearing this is that, you know, when I worked on just the solo piece and took it um, apart from the quintet, um, I'm obviously playing parts of it much faster than they happen in the quintet. It just seemed to make sense. It was kind of more jazzy that way. I would say that I have um, my approach to solo pieces in general, and like an another favorite example is the Messin uh, Appel Interstellaire, is that you, I, I object to when people just change all the rhythms around. <laughs> so I think that you, you know, it's really important to start with what is marked, and then you have to, then your responsibility is how to present the piece. But um, it's how, how far do you go in that direction without it, okay, those are the questions, without it being the piece anymore. So I, I'm trying to maintain the rhythmic integrity of it, but I'm, I'm playing faster. As I look at it, there are a lot of things I would do differently now. 
<laughs> so I do see some questions here. Is there a recording available with the quintet? As far as I know, there are two recordings available. The one that um, that I'm on, that was the one I was playing. And there's also one with the original group, which was with Heinz Holliger, uh, Radovan, uh, Andras Schiff, and Klaus Tunemann, and I'm not remembering the clarinetist name right now. Um, so, and both of those you can find on YouTube. Um, so they're very accessible. Let's see, okay. How do you rehearse this? Do you use a conductor? That's a really good question. So um, the Schoenberg Wind Quintet, um, a really complicated piece. It was in a certain way, his first truly 12 tone piece. And um, early performances of it were conducted. And then uh, Gunther Schuler organized, when he was playing principal horn at the Met, organized a performance of it. And they rehearsed it for 50 hours, 100, I don't even know how, there's on and on. And they put, they made a recording of it. And it's really impressive. It's really slow. But it's partly getting used to the language. Um, so now people don't play that with a conductor. Um, with In learning this piece, we didn't use a conductor, no. But um, uh, it's how to, you know, like you, you, sometimes you have to do things uh, like two people at a time to be able to hear how things fit together because having everyone fit together is what is the most challenging. Um, let's see, there may be his most complicated piece of all in this regard is the uh, third string quartet. Um, and in that piece, the uh, first performances of it, the members of the string quartet, I think it was the composer string quartet, they played it with the click track so they had a click track going so that they had something to establish a common sense of what a meter was because all of the parts were so wildly diffused from each other. Um, another piece that is along those lines, which um, I conducted a number of times, is the, the concerto, uh, double concerto for harpsichord and piano. And that has an instrumental ensemble, the solo piano, solo harpsichord, and four percussion. But at certain times, he differentiates it as if it's like two ensembles. And so it kind of builds to a sort of climax and then there's a, a grand pause bar. And then after that, the, the uh, uh, piano is in three, four and the harpsichord group is in 12, 16 or in four. So as conductor at that point, you have to conduct like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And actually what's really hard about that is turning the page. Because <laughs> then, oh no, where am I? So I had to mark each page like, oh, I'm gonna turn this one with the left hand and keep conducting this group and, or this one with the right hand and conduct that group. But um, you, know, you get better at it as you practice, that's all. And all of these things are, you know, they're good training. <laughs> um, and you know, the interesting thing is that I would, his music became more and more layered and complicated. Maybe the most complicated piece of his that I conducted was Syringa. There's no horn in Syringa. And um, really beautiful piece, but the first time I heard it, I couldn't make sense out of it at all. And it's only when I studied it and listened to different layers of it that I, it's really one of my favorite pieces. So how many people are going to do that? I don't know. We're not responsible for where this will be in 100 years. We're just responsible for trying to make things as convincing as we can now. And or follow the things that we believe in, you know? So then you get into other questions. Um, let's see, uh, were there other questions in the chat? Do you see anything else there? I don't see anything else right now. Um, if you do have any more questions for Bill, you're welcome to ask them now. Um, I find this, um, the piano wink with that and also the, uh, that solo horn piece to be an extremely healthy to play in all the sorts of ways that uh, Jesse was talking about, you know, blowing through all of, through these registers. Yeah, I mean, uh, the registers are very extreme, but it's not angular. It's really very healthy and, and quite beautiful writing. It's, um, I find. Any questions at all? Maybe you could ask, why are you doing this? 
that is a friend of mine who is a pianist was playing a um, piano concerto by Milton Babbitt, which was really quite an abstract piece. And his father, who was, I think, a surgeon, came backstage in Carnegie Hall and said to him, I sure hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> So, well, what do you think of this piece? I'd be curious to hear your reaction to it. If anyone has any thoughts, you're welcome to raise your hand and we can let you unmute and ask the questions or if not, that's fine. Uh, Bill, did you just see Veronica's comment? Oh, thank you. I'm glad that I'm very happy to read that. Uh, Good. I'm glad that you took away much from this. I would say that the main thing is that, you know, you, I support that people should follow what they feel for and what they don't feel for. Um, but I would place a very high value on curiosity. You know, my wife is a wonderful pianist and she has, she, Elliot Carter is not something she's interested in at all. And one of my favorite, um, musicians, um, Reinbert de Leeuw, a Dutch conductor, who was um, a real new music person, and Elliot Carter did not speak to him at all. And, you know, we're all different. So we're not responsible for that. Let's see. Yes, I support that. Yes, go for it. <laughs> Good idea. Wonderful. Well, if there are no more questions. Good. Good. Here, Glad to hear that. Um, we can end the session. Oh, Anita, today. that's you. Good. I'm glad to hear you're doing that. Uh, good. Excellent. Great. So, Bill, thank you so much for being here today. Sorry, I'm just kind of squatting next to you right now, here. but thank you. It's uh, wonderful to have you all here. And again, thank you so much for your patience with our slight technological glitches this morning. Um, this has been the first Horn Camp Connect live from 20 or KVHC 2022. Really glad that you're here today. If you'd like to rewatch this session, you can find it on our YouTube page, which is uh, YouTube. I mean, youtube.com slash a Kindle bets. Um, you can also follow us on social media. We have Instagram and Facebook, and you can email us if you want to, or you know, carrier pigeon, anything you want to do. Carrier We're in pigeon. New Hampshire right Good. now, so it, the carrier pigeon will probably find its way. Uh, <laughs> join us tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Eastern time in the U.S. for the next edition of Horn Camp Connect live from KBHC 2022. It will be featuring our natural horn faculty, Sadie Glass. And it should be really interesting. She's going to teach oh. on how to teach the first lesson to a Excellent. young student. I think we might have a young student here to help us. It's, it's one of the scholars. Um, so if we'll see you again soon. And again, thanks so much for your patience. Have a great day. See ya. Thank you. Have a great morning.